Not hearing that. Welcome, everybody. This is Michael Collazo, uh, CEO of OpenSea Direct. Uh, this is the podcast for and by event organizers, presented to you, of course, by OpenSea Direct. We help event organizers sell tickets easily, get paid instantly, and eliminate junk fees. Go to OpenSeaDirect.com and sign up for free or save $20 when you enter promo code OSD20 at checkout. It is a pleasure to have uh, uh, an old connect of mine, uh, now based in Florida, but uh, met him when he was in uh, uh, based in New Jersey, let's say, but still does work all around the United States and the world. Um, a true expert in nightlife marketing, so this is a great fit for those event organizers who love to hear from a pro. Uh, let me welcome tonight uh, Wagner Mateo, aka DJ Fidikao. How are you, sir? <laughs> That's right, right. You're used to that. You're used to that. <laughs> How you doing, Mike? All hey, good. Man. Long time too. Yeah, so it's great to. Yeah, have for real. Yeah, yeah, it's been a few years, but. I'm excited to have you on. Um, Cats would love to hear all the fun stuff you've been involved with in your career. But I always first like to get a figure out, uh, real basic. So would love to fill us in. Uh, just first off, like where you were born and raised. Like how did it all start on a simple standpoint? Uh, yeah, I, I was born in the Dominican Republic. And uh, up until nine years old, um, I would live there. And, and then we... We migrated here and then I go back and mm -hmm. forth, you know, between my teen years, we would go there every summer. Yeah. Um, up until maybe I think like once I graduated high school, once I was like 18, um, 19, we stopped going there. I, my mom stopped sending us there. And then I kind of disconnected from the culture and then I reintegrated back into the culture about 12 to 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, I started going back and just reading, learning, re you know, it's funny because people think that, you know, you're Dominican, they automatically categorize you and say, oh, well, you should be acclimated to whatever culture, you know, you're from. Right. right. And that wasn't the case because, you know, you know, coming here at such an early age, um, it just kind of reprogrammed me to the American culture. Right. And then right. that's all I knew for a long time. And now. I'm pretty well versed in the Dominican culture now. now I, and it's funny. A little bit, now, yeah. I, yeah, I train myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Well, yeah, yeah. We've all met people, for instance, you know, my parents are from Puerto Rico. We've met people that they may even know Spanish, but never been to the island. That does happen. Right. It's not a natural where everybody goes back and forth all the time. Uh, right. So there's certainly some of that, yeah. And I yeah. guess, yeah, coming up through here, you had that, you know, bilingual, bicultural vibe experience, let's say. But, and then at some point, I'm fascinated growing up in Jersey and back and forth, like what uh, what drew you to, you know, eventually starting in the nightlife? Because it seemed like you were a DJ, the music side was sort of, you know, brought you yeah. in. I'm curious to hear more about that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was honestly, it was almost by mistake. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a lover of music. I've always been a lover of music. Uh, that's something that was, it's really, uh, I came to the table with, right? It's just the love. And a friend of mine named DJ Willie, he, um, he was already doing these types of shows. He was DJing and he was doing other types. So I jokingly said, hey, I would like to try that out one day. Yeah. So he probably archived that and kept it there. And then when the time was right, he said, hey. So he called me one time and said, hey, remember you told me you wanted to do this? So I was wondering if you could be my assistant and just kind of help me out and do let's do a party together. And then we'll, if you like it, we'll produce something together. And I did. I, I tried it and then I liked it. And then the rest was history. I mean, we kept doing things and meeting people and then one thing led to another and just became an addiction and we just kind of like just yeah you know like the adrenaline rush of putting events together it just it was something that i found very fascinating and um and where in new jersey did that start the the work newark, you were doing then newark, new in jersey. newark right so brick city yeah, yeah. Flamboyant okay. manor <laughs> oh there you go northward right do i have that right northward yeah verona that was a northward spot yeah okay yeah so so we started doing that and then you know and just slowly evolved uh, into what I am today, which is like, you know, a jack of all trades in this space. And, yeah. you know, I started doing the whole DJ thing and I was doing that for a long time around 20, uh, yeah, 2011. I probably took a break from it just because I wanted to focus more on the marketing, producing yeah. the event. 
even though I was already doing that, I was doing both at the same time. Yeah. So I said, let me focus on one, really get really strong, polish this skill. And that's it, man. I mean, so since about 2011, 2012, you know, I really haven't DJ live in the club. You know, wow. so, yeah, so it's yeah. been about eight years. <laughs> I think I recall the doing both, honestly, when I first met you, where you're kind of like juggling a couple of yeah, both. I was and then both. so and then what I think is fascinating about your career, because you're still in the game, is like you're you're going from one so let's say generation of what the hottest music was in let's say Caribbean Latino space in this part of the world, Miami, New York City, Philadelphia, what have you, where it was almost like a salsa merengue pachate era, and then nowadays it's more obviously. Reggaeton, no, Dembo, right. what have you. So you, yeah. So a lot of your DJ specialty was what, like at the beginning, was it? Oh, in the beginning, it was straight tropical music. In the beginning, yeah. yeah. Um, it was, you know, at the time, you know, during that era, which is like 95, 96. Right. Merengue mambo, like street merengue, was like you know the Amarfes, the you know exactly. Julie, Julie, Banda Gorda, like all those guys were were rocking. Right. So you know, and also the the live event shows were a lot more popular, right? So meaning that now the events are more DJ driven. You have a lot of DJs are just headliner. And right. Then it was a lot of the live acts, right? Which is now it's coming back this way again. A little but, bit. Yeah. 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 So we started doing that and we started doing, you know, a lot of merengue bachata, pipico, um anything that was really in the tropical space. We did we didn't do much salsa. We did a little bit of salsa, but we did a lot of merengue bachata. A lot of the Dominican stuff, right? We did a lot of Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um you know then we that go into freestyle. We did some of that stuff, and a lot, a lot of it with the artists. And so when I started doing those shows with live artists, is when I started meeting a lot of people. You know, I started meeting managers and and, and right. publicists and this and that. People who I know until this day. You know, and those people then evolve themselves, and then now they're professional in their their fields. And right. And uh, so you know, some people work at YouTube. They work at radio stations. So, you know, you could see their up and coming people back then. Today they are, you know, established. They have careers, and they're still in the space. Some are not, but some are. Right. Uh, but that's how, I, that's how I met everybody because sometimes I, I start asking myself, man, how does a guy from Newark who was doing a party like in the hood starts meeting all these right, people right. that are now in these high positions and 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 you know, and I say, you know, people ask me that all the time, and I said because I met them early in their career and yeah. I built that relationship, and then that kind of just went along. And we both were doing our thing and then we grew and then we run into each other in places. So it's just a historic, a lot of historical stuff there um, that that I, I, I'm very grateful to have been part of early on. So like, I mean, Alex Sensation, I used to pay Alex Sensation $200 for a gig. Right. So for those who don't know, Alex and Jay is the biggest, you know, uh, tropical Latino DJ pipes out of New York City, Miami international yeah. figure now has worldwide hits and all that but yeah, yeah he was the guy you were paying a couple hundred to play a room essentially. and even yeah, days that we made no money he took no money right. no. so it, it was right it was like that and then again you start meeting people that come with them and this that and then those people become you know right the, the business and they start so right it's a, it's a network like a web that keeps you know kind of yeah so it's like, hey, I used to be Sosa's assistant. Now I am the director of so and so. You know. Yeah, no doubt. I yeah. remember Brian Brian Pino, who's now the guy at Sirius XM. Okay. Um, he was an assistant PD when I met him, and mm -hmm. at, uh, at Univision, and now he's he leads up a whole channel in, in Syria. So, you right. know, so there there are people again, and it's a lot a lot of it is relationship building, maintaining relationships throughout right. the years, and something that I felt that I've done well. You know, it's just maintain those connections. Uh, some people I don't talk to every day, some I do, but yeah. my phone number has not changed in like 20 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, you know, people come yeah. out of the blue calling me like, hey, like, you, you still, still here? I'm like, yep, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, I'd love to paint the picture. So let's say the aughts to like 210. I mean, you were what, three, four days a week? And I, you know, six days a week. Six. So I, I remember some of them. So there was a, we talked off air. There was D. Belange and Montclair. I think that mm -hmm. was like a Thursday. There yeah. was Bliss in Clifton, New Jersey. This is all North Jersey, folks. So Clifton, New Jersey is Bliss, if I remember, on a Wednesday, if I have that right. Yeah. Um, and then I actually listened to your pod. I found it interesting. Alex and Chase, like, oh, remember when you had problems with Montclair? I got you to Coco Bone, go to Elizabeth. I remember yeah, listening yeah. to the combo, right? So that talks about your old connections and how you were all working together. Right, exactly. A lot of yeah. historical stuff. Yeah. 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 And then of the six, like, that, how much of that was 
you promoting, hey, I'm here, good party, but then how much of it was we have a budget through a uh, liquor sponsor or the nightclub to pay for a band or pay for a bigger yeah, you know, celebrity it, outside of you? It, it depends on the scenario or on yeah. the situation at the time or the artists themselves or with the budget we had to work with, we would try to go out and, and seek sponsorships from either liquor distributors, which is a, you know, liquor distributors and the nightclub business that kind of go hand in hand, right? Yeah, that's a, one of the big ones from my recall. Yeah, right? so we, you know, I have relationships but to this day still with, you know, with Allied, r and &R, all the main yep. distributors um, that, you know, so every now and then I'll ping somebody, hey, you know, I have this artist on this venue, blah, 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 you know, any interest there, you know, jumping on board, doing some sort of collaboration or co-branding. Whatever, and if they if they're interested, usually it's is a a quick conversation, small PowerPoint deck, and off we yep. go. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that, that six days was that once a month, like because that that's a no. That was that was that I had I had a, a party from literally Tuesday all the way till Sunday, right? right? And right as as the week progressed, like Wednesday was bliss. Um, Thursday, I think it was Coco Bongo. Saturday was 46 Lounge. 46, um, right. Yeah, Friday right. was the Diva Lounge again. I did two parties in the same club. Yep. Um, yep. You know, different formats. Um, and, uh, but before that, I mean, before that, I was doing parties in Newark all the time. And uh, right. I feel the big break did come from Diva Lounge. Um, okay. And uh, I think when, when she called me, there Who's was she off in? Uh, her name was Vicky. Yeah, okay. Vicky so the not, owner? The old owner yeah. then? No, yeah, she, she was the old owner there. And then someone, I think we were making so much noise in Newark and Elizabeth, but we were doing uh, this club Pocache in Elizabeth, and we were making okay. so much noise. Somebody told her, put it in her ear, and said, hey, you got to talk to this guy. And she finally called me up. You know, and I remember Vicky. Vicky is very colorful. Vicky's like, this is not the hood. This is not Elizabeth. This is not Newark. What are you going to do for me here? I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, you know, so, um, you know, we, we hit it off right away. You know, she, she saw the passion and she saw the, the drive. And I think she wanted someone like that. I think she was looking for someone like that. Right. Um, where, you know, promoters tend to have a, a reputation of just kind of doing the minimum and want to get paid, you know. So I, I think she... You know, she she definitely identified with me, and I think she, you know, we, and believe it or not, to this day, Vicky and I have a relationship, and and um, her son Chris. I mean, you know, so like we we we're all connected. Like I try to maintain right. all my relationships. I mean, let me look at you. I mean, you know, I keep yes. all my relationships open. You know, because you never Absolutely. know. You know, you never know what's around the corner, right? So that's it. That's it. Um, yeah. But yeah, but those, those those parties, man. Like I said, I, I think I was doing these parties in Newark, Elizabeth, Newark, Elizabeth for a while, and I think when she finally got the when I finally got that phone call for Diva, I felt like it was almost like graduation, right? I felt like, okay, I'm going into a suburb now. It's no longer my comfort zone. Right. It's no longer my, my area, right? I'm going into an area or a neighborhood that I I don't know anyone there and no one, you know. And believe it or not, as once we started formatting the, the, the party, um, people started coming out, people who I've never met in my life. I never knew. And right. you have some of the old people come in and stuff like that. But sure, yeah. it was a whole new, it was like me starting over. Um, with the experience that I had gained. Right. And once that happened, that party was successful. I mean, that was one of my most successful venues. I mean, we were doing 700 people a week there. It was insane. Right. And, um, from there, then, you know, the owner of 46 Lounge now, Hendrick, came to Diva Lounge. He was my customer at Diva Lounge. And then from there, him and I, you know, linked up, and then we started doing that party there. And then Bliss came along. I mean, pretty much everything came from the Diva Lounge party because I think people noticed that. Like, right. Wow, this guy is doing all this stuff. All this, you know, he's driving all these people. He's moving all these people. Right. I, uh, there's a website called Fiesta Caliente that I used to own. Still right. own the domain name to this day. Yeah. Um, and you know, we kind of formatted and structure our, our entire campaign around our website. You know how we how people and then we, we were one of the very few. Like were the, outside of the, in the city, um, you know, there was a, a group called Velvet List um, that was based out of New York City. Yeah, and they were kind of the one that we were emulating, you know, and we were looking at John Gungi Rivera, also another inspiration. That's um, a legendary New York City promoter oh, name. He, Absolutely. He, 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 to me, he's the godfather yeah. of all event productions, promoters, whatever. Right. So, you know, so I studied those people and I studied them and I said, okay, I want to kind of format myself that way. Um, 
And and in Jersey, we really no one really was doing that at the time. Um, and then you know, and then social media came out, right? MySpace came out, and all those things started to evolve. And then we had more tools. Right. And I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, unlimited texting came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I find interesting you mentioned Fiesta Caliente. So before social media obviously took off, then most promoters uh, would have a website, and that's where you would see photos. Like I know that sounds weird to someone who. Crazy. Doesn't remember that, but it was essentially like a flip, you know, like a flip, a virtual flip, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, photo album where you would flip through and say, "Oh, there's a pictures of Thursday night at X place." Mm -hmm. We're now obviously it's so I, IG and and driven that way. Needless to say, uh, yeah. If you want to see your photo, then you have to go on the website. You have to right. register, give me your email, and Correct. then I turn around and send you more campaigns. Right. You know, and exactly. So, so, you know, we were hard, we, we would harvest so much data because we were moving so many people um, right throughout, throughout New Jersey that then the content promoters started to reach out, you know, Live Nation, Golden Boys, right. AG Live. Um, they right. all started to reach out. And then I became the local promoter for all of these conglomerates like like Live Nation. And right. know, every, time I, every time I see Rebecca Leon in, in an Instagram post, I'm like, wow, like I used to work for her at Golden Voice, you know, so. Yeah. So, you know, so I became that person because I have all this data, right? And all, right. These, all, all, all these bodies that I had, you know, at my disposal. Not only that I have uh, electronic data, I also had phone numbers and I had physical addresses, right? Because, you know, we were doing ID scans and we were, you know, and we were breaking all kinds of privacy laws, man. We were, we were <laughs> I see. I was going to say, so the way you'd capture, this is a good, this is really great with from a marketing element standpoint. So yeah. obviously the, that, the, the old style of like, you know, sign up for my website, you get the email there. Um, eventually, I guess there were, you would get phones, phone numbers, how, let's say before and after, I guess, social so media. So the phone number collection usually came when someone, when, when, when the texting got popular, right? Right. And okay. the minute you would text us or call us or say, you know, we would get your phone number, we would have somebody walking around collecting phone numbers. Um, yep. Yep. Then we adapted our form on our website to include a phone number. Um, then we, you know, as I think it was in 2012 or 2010, what I, we then started adapting the SMS stuff. We started using SMS service, to right. send out blast. Um, so, you know, we, as the technology improved, we also adapted and we also embraced a lot of technology into our campaigns. And, right. you know, we were doing email blast maybe before, I mean, many people were doing email blast. You know, we had our own list server. We were doing, you know, we were sending, we were. The same data we were harvesting, we were pushing it out to our own email servers. And right. then the other, like, you know, then Constant Contact came out. Then, you know, uh, right. all of the other, like, mail list service came out, made things a little easier. Right. Um, you know, I mean, we don't, I mean, it was so many toll gates we had to go through, so many challenges. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it was really trying to get that message across to the customer, right? That was really our goal. And and we were ruthless, man. We, we, we no matter what, we were just trying, okay. It was so much data coming from all over the place that we just didn't know. Right. You know, it's just, it was wild, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so, yeah, that's that goes fast forward. Once you start saying, "Hey, I'm gonna," you know, uh, pull away from the juggling, the G DJing, and the and the promotion just for yes. the marketing. So, let's say from two eleven on, how does it look like from you know focusing on nightlife market, lifestyle marketing, light nightlife marketing, but also how it might have changed where today's tools or you know what are today's tools that are doing doing well compared to then yeah i mean i think i think you know that that was a, it was a it was a a blessing and a curse right because as technology yeah. evolved and the tools were available and the tools were at, at a low cost right because you know i remember when, when we used to text uh, it was like hey text me after seven or after eight when my plan allows it for free right yeah right, and, right. yeah <laughs> and then Unlimited texting became a thing, right? It's like you could now text unlimited and no matter what time of the day, blah, 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 whatever. Right, right. right. And, and so then that, that enabled the direct contact with the consumer, right? We then started right. now getting direct text messages. Hey, Mike, are you coming out tonight? Now I had your number directly, right? Right. Um, we will still engage with the, with the um, uh, uh, text SMS uh, blast or whatever. Right, uh, like easy texting or whatever those services were, you know. But there was also a personal report. You know me, I know you. I text you, hey, what are you doing tonight? Come out. So it, we would give it a lot of more personal touch, uh, right. rather than you getting a text back from like five two two seven or something that 
Correct, hey, right. So, but again, but because we had over 30,000 text messages or the phone numbers, we had to do it that way, you know, because I can't text 30,000 people on my own, right? No, exactly. <laughs> right. No, right. But it can be branded you and come from you. Hey, and then yeah. personalize that first name. I mean, hey, John. Hey, Quartier. yeah. I mean, it was so many things that came out of that. I mean, album release parties. I mean, I got hired to produce album release parties. Like Daddy Yankee Barrio Fino, I produced that album release party at uh, Nikki Beach in Manhattan. Okay. You know, so right. there was like Julieta Venegas, I believe her album release party. So there was a lot of things that we did for artists outside of just me putting a party together. There was right. a lot of industry stuff. Sony would hire me to produce these parties right. um, for their artists, right? And that had, right. that was strictly, hey, go find their club, go do this, and we'll invite all the guests. So I was really just their hired help pretty much to put together the, the venue, decorate it, you know, right. all that good stuff. Right, um, right. So, you know, there was a lot of branching out things that I've done um, that necessarily weren't my responsibility, but I was more hired um, to do that part, either produce the event or market the event or both. Right, right, yeah. right. And then, I was, so yeah, you were, you know, still hot parties and then getting paid to execute, again, album releases and stuff. And then have you also done some other stuff? It seems like there's some more lifestyle related uh, travel and other things. Yeah. How much have yeah. you done from a marketing standpoint there? Um, you know, what's funny that I started doing the travel thing um, just because when I met my wife, we, she just, she was a traveler. So she's like, all right, well, let's travel, whatever, whatever. We started doing that. And then I got the bug, right? I became addicted to travel. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, one thing led to another, we just kept going and kept going. I mean, and then, then I found it that I connected a lot more with people because they like that lifestyle. They, you know, who doesn't like traveling, right? So right. I, I think that I was able to create a niche without me realizing it because every time I would put a party together or something together, more people, I, I, was, I would say like 2012, I think I'm, 2012, 2013, more people would come up to me, ask me, hey, so how was Greece? How was this? How was this? Yeah. That they were asking me about the travel versus as opposed to the party, right? Right. So that became a little thing. Um, you know, did I see a value in it? I it did because it was more of a personalized thing and people felt more connected. Like, well, this guy's doing what I like to do. It's not just, you know, going to a club, pop bottles and whatever, you know. Right. Now he's doing things outside of that space that I can relate to or I wanna relate to. Right. So then that kind of got got people to you know, a little more uh, gravitating towards me, you know, and say, hey, I saw that you went to Peru, you know, I saw that you went yeah. here, but you went there. And that immediately became a connection. And then I got their phone number and email and I was sending more promotions. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So Were you then doing uh, events overseas or? or, or very know? little, very little. Okay. You know, we did some stuff Just curious. For one year. Um, we've done some getaways in Puerto Rico. Um, we've done stuff, you know, when I was in Jersey, we were doing stuff here in Miami all the time. Right. Um, VR, I've done some stuff out there. Uh, what else? I mean, mostly it's been most of the continental USA, you know, usually, okay. um, Canada, Toronto. I mean, I used to go to Toronto once a month. Um, yeah, it's day. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, LA, San Francisco, the Bay area. Oh man, I love the Bay area, man. Bay area was, was really good to me. And that's, you know, they were really, um, San Diego, you know, right. the West Coast was really good. Denver, Chicago, right. Iowa. I went to Iowa. Nobody nobody believes me when I tell them that there are Latinos in Iowa. A lot. Absolutely. Des Moines <laughs> and other cities. Yep. Absolutely. Des Moines, Iowa. That's correct. Absolutely. 110%. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, I, I started looking back, you know, just through conversation. And I'm like, oh, man, I forgot I went there. You know, so yeah. <laughs> New Orleans, yeah. I DJ there, you know. So I've done yeah. a lot of stuff all over the country as a DJ um, where it allowed me you know, and that's what I started to enjoy when I started to separate the duties from me being the promoter and the DJ in New Jersey. I would right. still get to go out of state and DJ because I had no responsibility there, right? Which is like, hey, show up, oh, you hire know, gun, yeah, play music, do your thing, yeah. and and you're done, right? Right. Where in New Jersey uh, or anywhere that I was responsible for the event, it was like, all right, well, let me you know organize the event, get my staffing, get my this, my marketing, right. get that. And then on top of that, I also had to make sure that my music was on point because, you know, updated and, you know, in, in practice. And you know, so it yeah. became a little bit, a lot for me, you know, it became overwhelming for me 
Mm-hmm. And I felt that I wasn't going to be good at either one unless I was, you know, unless I focused on both. And I right. see a lot of guys, they, they still do that now. They kind of do the double job. Um, and, you know, kudos to them. You know, if you can do both and be great at it. Hey, listen, man, I, I personally want to home in and become great. You know, and I think yeah. that, you know, from the birth of like, you know, Diva Lounge, Blizz, all those rooms, I had to step away. Even that Blizz, I was still DJing. But um, once Blizz was over, I kind of said, all right, I'm going to focus more on the next room. But I'm just going to be the promoter and the event producer and the, and the marketer and kind of right. run my team. And and I, I never look back, man. Like I said, every now and then I get the itch. I'm like, ah, I should go back and just spinning. And, yeah, you know, yeah. But, you know, then I get over it. But, you know, you never know. One of these days yeah. you see me. <laughs> A big wedding or something, like a star-studded wedding or something. You never know, man. You know, yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, as long as you have the passion, I feel that, and this goes to anybody that's listening to you to, to this this pod. Uh, as long as you have passion, you can do anything. You know, if you it. can become a painter. If you're passionate about it, you'll become the best painter because if you love what you do, you really don't feel like you're doing a chore or a task. You're just right. loving what you what you're doing, and I feel that I've been blessed enough to to enjoy what I've done, you know, especially the results, right? When you put something together, you, 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 you two months putting an event together and the event day is here and people come out and they have a great time and you build this epic event and, and people walk out and like, wow, I have really good time, you know? So that to me is the instant gratification for, for what I do. And I, I feel that the adrenaline rush that I get when someone mentions to me a room or a concert or something that I could produce and it's a, it's a challenge and the adrenaline rush because now you're tasked with getting people to come out to a particular venue. So That's it's a challenge, right? right? And it's like, yeah. okay, how creatively I'm going to do to get Michael's interest. I mean, you know what? I'm going to go check out that place. You yeah, know, right. So I had to sell the event to you in such a way that you're, you on your own make a decision, right? right. Where, where not me harassing you and be like, hey, you coming, you coming, you coming, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And promoters do that. You know, people get annoyed. They don't like that because. Yeah. People want to make their own choices, right? So I think what I did was I focused on how good the marketing presentation was, like, you know, an art creative or a video ad or, you know, or, or, or an artist that you wanted to see, right? I had to figure out, well, this guy, I do that, for example, you know, if people would love them. Let me do a show with them. Right. You know, so like I had to figure out creatively how to get you to make that choice on your own. And then come back next week. <laughs> right, right. Repeating, <laughs> repeating business is better, right? Yeah. So I had not only I had to sell you, I also had to sell you in such a way that you were like, "Wow, I'll be back next week." Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that was that was for me a challenge, but it was also a a, a, a very gratifying effort um, all the time. I mean, it was week to week, and then remember six parties. You know, I had to do this for every single party a different experience right so you have diva thursdays and you have bliss wednesday and you have 46 lounge saturday which is more of like the dress up night on a saturday night yeah but, right, you know, right. then you have a dega lounge third uh, sundays which was um more of a you know jeans and sneakers come hang out yeah, chill, you know, that's sunday that's night drink. Yeah. um i used to do a uh, a poetry thing on tuesday you know so it, it, you know the only day i rested really was on mondays and and it wasn't really rest because now we're putting together the stuff for the next week, right? I was gonna so, say, yeah, yeah. So it was very intense, um, you know. And but I think I think that ultimately the results are what spoke. And I think if people look back, I mean, to this day, people tag me on stuff like, "Oh man, I remember this one, 2011." Oh, somebody tagged me yesterday on something, you know. Yeah. So you know, people to this day. So I, I know sometimes I I feel like I'm not gonna do that much, but sometimes when I see people tag me on things or say, Hey, remember the time you did this? Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I did do that. You know? And you know, it, it's, it's amazing because people still remember. So while I was doing that, I don't necessarily think like that was that I was like intense or I was great or I was, I was just trying to get to the next party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. I can imagine. Yeah. I was just trying to survive, man. So I yeah. was like, I had to think like the horses, you know, I'm like, the I don't care. On, yeah. Yeah. Break, break. So <laughs> keep going, like, you know. But now yeah. that I get to step back and look at it, and look at old videos, old pictures. I mean, fourteen hundred people at Blizz on a Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. Like, Holy shit! I did that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's enough. <laughs> Wednesday. That's that's good. You know, and that's on Wednesday good. night, and I remember telling Joey, you know, uh, the owner at the time, and he's like, "Oh, we could probably do two, three hundred people here on a Wednesday night." He goes, "I'll, I'll be happy with that." 
So yeah. his expectations was 300 people. We ended up putting there 1,400 people. Yeah, right. Right. A slow night was like 700. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, so you know, a snowy so, night in January or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, so it's yeah. You know, a, a lot of it again, a lot of it, it was like I mentioned, it was really me trying to creatively do things that I didn't have to harass you to come out because you were right. really like, man, if I miss this party, then I, I'm I'm just no good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was your decision that you and and every week people kept doing the same thing. They kept coming back and coming back. That's and coming it. back. So I built a following, right? And, and I didn't even right. realize that I had a following because when I was doing the parties in Newark, it was artist driven. They weren't coming for me. They were coming for the artist. I was going to say, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you've talked about that. You told, hey, what separates, you know, the best would be if you have the budget to get Daddy Junkie at, at its peak popularity, that's that's an easier play than consistently on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday absolutely. night. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah no, so, no question about it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I didn't realize, you know, in, in those early days, you know, yeah, we were touting ourselves as DJs or whatever, but like, you know, we'd be like, you know, DJ Freakout, DJ Willie, but we have Auto Solido. You know, right. the draw was really them, right. right? And we were there to kind of like piggyback, you know, off of the people that were there for them. And then we made our name for ourselves because of that, right? Because so then the business changed. Then around 2011, 20, around 2012, 2013, okay. the, the business model changed. I became DJ driven. You know, you got right. guys like Alex Sensation, DJ Lobo, Anelvi, Camillo, all these guys were really running a lot of the like major rooms. Right. And, and then, you know, then that brought on more DJs, more, you know, and then promoters got smart that, well, I only got to spend X amount on this particular guy and as opposed to having a band. The with, overhead's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, DJ, the DJ will come in with what? Maybe an assistant, a photographer at that, most two people. Right. Where a band, you have to accommodate 13, 14 flights, hotel, per diems, all this good. I mean, you know this stuff. like Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. No, and, and in some bands, you know, you're talking about a, you know, five-figure number. Yeah. You know, fly them in from Dominican Republic. I need the eight pieces, 12 pieces, you know, mm -hmm. for the Dominican bands, you know, in, those, in that era. That's yeah. serious. That's serious money. Yeah. Because you need right. the liquor sponsor in those days more than ever because Absolutely. that was a serious and, and uh, you, coin. You get into that. You get into that, like. And it, be, it becomes a mess because, you know, and how do we do it? I have no idea. You know, I, sometimes I would get a phone call like, hey, so-and-so's in town. You know, so sometimes I would do things that way. I would rather wait for a tour rather than me saying I am going to bring, you know, right. Nico Mendez from the yard with his 15 musicians and his entire right. staff. And now I got to pay rooms. Right. And, uh, so what some guys started doing was they just started saying, well, Mike, I'm going to have this guy come in on this day. Um, do you want to split the expenses of travel and, and lodging and whatever? And we would get a couple of five or six guys and say, Hey, you're gonna have this day, I'm gonna have this day, this day, right. and you know, the, the, the expenses for travel and hotel is, is I don't know, ten dollars. So you two dollars, you two, I pay two, yeah. and we will offset the cost that way. Um, right. if the artist was, you know, obviously it was an artist that we knew was a good risk, right? Calculated risk, right? Um, but then most of the time it was really tours, it was mostly like Right. Hey, uh, you know, Anthony Santos is coming to town from November 1st to December 1st. I mean, right. Like a day. Cool. Right. right. And at that point, it became like an all in thing where, you know, I'm not worried about hotels. I'm not worried about uh, flights. I'm not worried about anything where the promoter that was buying that tour had to worry about all that. Correct. So right. I saw that was, that was more of a turnkey thing for me, even though they they they, they tagged a, a cost on top. But I just didn't want to deal with the logistical nightmare. Yeah. That, that I could you, no, right. And you had the benefit being in Northern New Jersey where these artists, their hottest tour dates could be New York City. And sometimes, you know, in the nightclub era of these bands, they were maybe doing three shows a night in New York City. So they might do you, they might appear with you Thursday or Friday at eight o'clock or whatever. And they're doing Friday, Saturday in New York or something. I mean, right. That and was the benefit if you weren't in central Pennsylvania or something. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that, 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 yeah. That, that's a good point. You know what? I didn't even think yeah. about that. And even though that was a real thing all the time, because they right. would be like, oh, okay, I'm going to give you this guy the first hour. And the first hour would be like midnight, right? Right. So you're going to have Anthony Santos or Luis Vargas or whoever. Like, right. I, I'll get to you at 12 and then I'll do an hour, 30 minutes or hour, 15 minutes. And I got to be in Manhattan at two. Yeah, you know, exactly. For time. So they would, right. you know, they would double dip on that. You know, that was that was very smart. You know, so and again, it was a win-win because if the artist was super hot, um, 
I, I didn't have to worry about all the added overhead. Correct. Just pay the artist and make sure that I made my artist budget, right? Um, Correct. But when you tack on expenses plus the artist budget, right. it, it became difficult. You know what I mean? And like you said, you know, we would reach out to liquor sponsors and sometimes we were not successful. Sometimes we were, um, right. depending on the artist. Like Aventura, when they first blew up, um, we had a lot of luck with them. And, you know, like liquor sponsors love them because they drew a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I call up Heineken and I say, hey, Aventura next month. And they would jump all over it. Yeah, I, I don't even need a, 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 a deck. Which is I like, was going to say the uh, <laughs> so so imagine all the husband and boyfriends that you know they're they're the women in their life insisted that you bring them to see how it yeah. a month later a nightclub Romeo Santos led you know mega group back then and it was only three four guys so that was probably a cost difference yeah yeah so um, you know so that and, and and we did that with a lot of acts a lot of artists I mean there were yeah. up and coming artists and. And, you know, some of them were, were already established and some of them were upcoming. And, right. and, you know, we just finagled the opportunity. We just said, all right, well, this opportunity is this opportunity is that. But again, I, you know, once the model changed, you know, I moved away from that model. And you at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned something about I've, I've gone to different generations of music. And you're right. You know, when, when I first started, like a lot of the merengue, bachata, stuff, and then, then the model changed a little bit into... The DJs, right? DJ driven, yeah. And more event theme, like you know, white party, glow stick party, this party, yacht party, whatever, you know, you know, it's like we we made a theme out of everything, right? And yeah, and people appreciated that Halloween party. I think we had the biggest Halloween party um in the state. I mean, we would like bliss, we would dress up the entire room um and transform into like a literally a haunted house, and there was a party in there. And you can go see those videos on YouTube, they're still there. And so, you know, Christmas, we had a party called Christmas in July, right? Right. And we would dress the entire club, Christmas theme, Santa Claus, snow, I mean, you name it. And it was in the middle of July. So, right. you know, so we had a lot of cool themes that, you know, that required no band. And even sometimes it required no headliner, like DJ. We, just, we would get like an opener and a closer. Right. And that was it. You know, and the guys okay. that, you know, had a decent name, but, but were really talented. So. Right. But then, you know, again, you know, we keep evolving. We then we start dropping. Then Alex and Vision started growing. DJ Camillo started growing. DJ Lobo started yeah. growing. So we started leveraging those guys because they we knew that they would bring in a good audience. Um, right. and, you know, again, and now I feel that the business is shifting again. You know, now we're seeing a little bit of traction with, with at least the stuff that I've done in the past six months. Okay. Um, it's all live artists. You know, it's, all, it's really? all, a lot of live artists. It's all... Um, and I like that because look, it's funny because I, I literally returned back to point A where I started from, which is yeah. doing a lot of Dominican stuff. Now um, I do a lot of urban stuff, Dembo, Dembo, a, a genre that I was so against for a long time, right? <laughs> and I was openly speaking about that, uh, yeah. th that I was against it. And I had to bite my tongue because they yeah, yeah. in such a movement that I had to revert back on my, on my statement and say, well... I made a mistake. <laughs> it's not so bad. <laughs> you know, there's always generations of like music. I mean, the famous story in American parlance is uh, like uh, uh, the the founder of Soul Train. He hated hip hop, you know. So there's uh, the the legendary, you know, uh, founder of Soul Train from 60s and 70s, uh, Don Cornelius. And then by the 80s, he hated hip hop. He wasn't he was against it. But that that and that became the golden era of hip hop and what drove what drove popularity yeah. so that there's always like this generational connect like oh, i'm not sure if i'm into this new movement and yeah, you know it's you know, either adapt or die in a way you know there's always like you know like and especially when you're like a purist right i feel like i'm a merengue yeah, yeah. purist like i love merengue i think it's in my blood i mean it, it's it, most of my influences as a child my mom played merengue in the house like Fernando Villalona, Los Rosario, right. like that's all i heard so right. you know that's embedded in my blood you know and right and I think when you become a purist like that on, on a particular genre of music or a particular cultural, um, you just, it's, it's a very hard move. Like, what do you mean, them both? No, 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 merengue. You know what I mean? And I was like that yeah. for a long time, Mike, a long time. To yeah. the point when I did my first dembo event, people were attacking me. They're like, you hypocrite. You were yeah, saying you, this. You switch. You switch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. So you through know, all but, that, I, I'd yeah. love to talk through, through all that, all the changes. What do you think are some through line tips or someone to try to do what you've done? Because again, you've done it over different music genres, different trends. What are sort of the, I'd love to hear from someone who's an expert like you, you know, 
tips on basic marketing with that. Uh, the 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 sponsor liquor negotiative sort of space is always a big one. People trying to start off right because they're trying to pay for the band or reserve the space. What are some sort of from you your feeling, you know, from day one to now over twenty years it's worked. You know, these are some basics to focus on in the work you've done. I think it's you have to be original. I, I think that. The, the number one thing that I can recommend to anyone who wants to get started in this space or is already right. in this space, right? Because right. you could reinvent yourself, right? I've reinvented myself many times over. Yeah. Um, I think be original, uh, be be yourself, connect with people, find a way. Like I said, I found a connection through travel that I didn't even know I had with people, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to find something that people enjoy. If you like to cook, put up videos of you cooking. If you know how to make a mean rice and to tostones and beans and show people right. that because people right. will identify with you and say, you know what? I like this guy. I'm going to go to his event because I like this guy. I, I connect with this person. Right. You know? right. So there's so many people that I connect with on social media when they, when I like that they way they do certain things and their profession is something else. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, one advice is, 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 is find something that outside of that, that is going to reel people curiosity in. You know, and again, you don't have to go stand on your head and, and do some TikTok video or anything like that, but find yeah. something that people like that you will feel that will be connected with you. You know, again, travel is, is a good one. Cooking, I don't know, break dancing, I don't do whatever. Whatever it is, right. You know, right. But, be, but be unique. And then when you are putting together an event, um, I think the way you present your event to the world speaks volumes of the quality of your production. You know, you know, a, a nice, art creative, clean, high res, you know, minimalistic. You know, I, I think that when you present to to the world your product or your event, it has to look like a million. I I used to have this joke all the time. I told my team, I'm like, I'm not looking at TMZ.com for website ideas. I'm looking at Microsoft.com. Mm -hmm. Because Microsoft.com has all the money to put together this great website. So right. look at the bigger guys. Don't look at the guy next to you, right? right. Look at Interesting, who, yeah. who you want to be. You know, and, In your case, like really the, the art design, the marketing design is a big element, you feel. And then obviously nowadays video with TikTok and IG and mm -hmm. the visual element, that's a big one to you. It is because I feel the way you package and present your product. You know, yeah. I've had people hire me to do their marketing just because of the packaging, right? It's yep. like, okay, let's, let's, you know, I've had guys, I mean, I, I did an event one time that comes to mind and I, from this topic that there was two DJs doing our verses against each other. Like one of those like round uh, battle royal kind of thing where we yeah. had them in a ring. And so how do I sell that? Right. I'm like, how do I sell this? And it, it was, uh, we had to do a brand new photo shoot. It was like, I told him, Hey, listen, you know, I, this flyer has to be like some real, like, you know, boxing looking thing where you got to facing each other and the dark yeah. lights and the hoodies, like, you know, like the way two boxers are, right? Right, right, so right. We literally went, booked the studio and took those photos and those photos, we used them for that promotion. So right. when the way we sold it, DJ Matt versus DJ Brinca, right? And right. it was, it looked like a, like a boxing bat, you know? Right. And then we had the girls and the thing with the signs inside there. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like we did all that, you know, but again, it's the way we package the event. Right. You know, literally, like some, uh, any promoter would probably be like, ah, oh, whatever, just give me two pictures that you got. And they would have just let them right. on the flyer and just said, all right, hopefully somebody come. Where we went, up the, we went a little above that. We said, no. I told those two DJs, hey, meet me here, bring two different changes of outfits, and we're going to take photos. And we took right. photos and we finally picked the photos out. And I wish I had it to show it to you, but like, you know, I'm sure it's somewhere on my computer, but yeah, yeah. We, we did. That was so cool because people came out to that. And these guys, right. it's not like they were, you know, uh, Tiesto or these big, big name DJs right. or not. Right. They were right. very solid nightclub DJs. Right. And, and they, people loved it. And, you know, we started doing that. We, we did it a few times. We did it round one, round two. So that's an example right there of, of packaging your product right yeah it, yeah you know you want to do something that you have a vision for uh make sure that you package that you present that well now with the with the birth of video and, and you know video has been in the past five years i think it's been skyrocketing 
right. you know, where people engage more with video. Right. Um, so that's the other thing, you know, motion graphics is a big thing for me. You know, you put together videos that, that are, are, are attractive, colorful, young, hip, you know, right. have a voice over on them and I, um, where it's reinforcing the, the imaging that's happening on the screen. So right. those things for me are big because I feel that part of my packaging, right? If I, you know, if I'm going to do an event with, I don't know, with, with freaking, you name it, any, any art, Dolly Parton, I don't know, I just, I just right, right, right. <laughs> but right, right. you do an event with oh, Dolly Parton, I'm going to make sure that I find the best complimenting photo of her. Let's figure out what her hits are, what her biggest shows were. Let's add all that footage into a video app. Right. So we we want to make sure that we want to package and sell things properly because I feel that if your flyer or your ad creative or your video does not look up to par with what the big guys are doing, then you're going to really miss out on the attention. Maybe not from the customer, sometimes even from the conglomerates because I think it's how people I start working you. They're like, man, this guy's doing all these things. Right. And that's how you will get calls from like the live nations of the world and the Prudentials and the right. arena right. or whatever. So, yeah, that's for me, it's kind of like my core belief. No, that's great. That's, you know, yeah. to really, you know, invest in it and for that to be top notch. That's a big part of it, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then when you get to the event, you know, when you get to the event, also make sure that what you advertise, you deliver. Yeah. Right? You advertise that we're going to be green unicorns there. I better see a green unicorn when I get to that club. Good question, yeah. You know, because then your credibility will start, will start to get questioned, right? Correct. Oh, man, Correct. I went to Mike's event. He said he was going to have horses there and nothing. He, yeah. had, a, he had an inflatable horse. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah no doubt. People, right. People do right. that. They take those shortcuts. And, you know, even if, you know, I'll be honest with you, even in events that I would lose money in but create an amazing experience, I would do it. I would say, you know what? I'll make zero from this thing. But guess right. what? Now that further improved or enhanced the credibility. Right. Right. Man, caliente, we're going to go to these parties because these guys, what, what, what they sell, they produce. right. And it's funny what you're thinking uh, for someone who worked on a, in a, on arena side and what have you. You know, you would be surprised uh, in arena big shows. Not all of them make money, and right. sometimes they are making investments to make sure they get a big artist or or something that'll be splashy in their local market um, mm -hmm. because they see it as like, hey, when you have let's say 80 openings, 120 openings. Yeah, you might lose on 15 of them, but you're making on 100, 100 of them, 105 of them. Exactly. And, so and, in the and, end, yeah, you're, yeah, the consistency of the quality, as you mentioned, sometimes you're going to whiff, but you're going to win more times than you lose. Yeah. And then when it comes yeah. to artists, man, listen, you know, and I was always very critical of Aventura sometimes because I felt okay. Romeo. Um, Romeo you know, Santos, legend. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I felt Romeo sometimes in the beginning. Now, I mean, I think now he, you know, obviously he's got all the money to pay for it, but I think in the beginning, you know, he didn't understand the whole marketing, branding, pictures, flyers, this, that. Okay. You know, where a lot of them, some of his stuff was like, eh. But now, I think now, you know, he finally got, or maybe again back then, he didn't understand. But now, because of how we're consuming content, you know, he's, mm -hmm. putting, he's putting out a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool videos, cool stuff, you know. But in the beginning, again, because like everybody else, he was still learning what where this digital thing was going as far as, you know, acting right. creatives and things like that. So, um, a lot of a lot of these, these artists and promoters and, and event producers, whoever, you, you you see it. You see that they don't really focus a lot of the time. But you know, and to the point is that Romeo back then with Aventura, they would really put out subpar artwork, but people still would come see them. So when the artist is like super hot, people don't care, man. You have it almost doesn't matter. A yeah. piece of paper, he's gonna be and yeah, right, right. It doesn't matter. You know, right. so all this thing that I'm saying about packaging your stuff, if you have. You know, uh, a, a super hot reggaeton artist. If you bring like, you know, Osuna or Lunai or one of these guys, you, you gotta do is just put it out once. And people, right. right? You know, um, so curious. Uh, two hot. other, no, absolutely. And I'm curious. Two other elements that seem to come up, or a few, but one is um, tips on you know having that good rapport from a sponsorship because liquor and beer, for instance, and other things, vaping, whatever it is so big in that nightclub or nightlife space of, you know, sponsored revenue yeah. and then just ticket sales, like operationally, obviously back in the day it was mostly at the door of velvet rope cash, but now it's, it's obviously a little more sophisticated than that. And yeah. just curious on those two points uh, in your work and your and tips in that regard. As far as, far as uh, ticket sales and things and thing like that. Um, it's funny because ticket sales, you know, we really didn't start 
doing that on the electronic side until a, a lot of the providers started coming out, right? You know, we'll make, um, you know, a lot of these ticket web and tickery and all these, right. all these providers um, right. that facilitated that. But before that, I mean, we were printing them. We were printing out the tickets. Yeah. Hard, hard, what they call hard <laughs> stock. It's, you know, here you go. You bought it. Here you oh go. Oh my right. God, man. You just and then cash at the door. You depending just on uncovered it. a memory that no, I know. I forgot yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. For that. Um, and it's funny because uh, when these physical tickets, we would do these shows with these artists and we would literally have to put on the on the flyer or the creative all the locations. Tickets right. being sold at the and we would have right. to it, it was we like all a know this. Wheel. <laughs> yeah, so we all know the uh very particularly like immigrant, you know, genre music like you know, Puerto Rican Dominican, you know, then it was the local bodegas and the, the Centro Musical over here and this mm -hmm. place. Like that was how you know, you had different points of sale that were literally in the neighborhood or in the communities, and then if they saw you hand to hand combat, you could sell it. And then again, buying at the door, if there was any room left, I mean, it's literally yeah. what it was until yeah. like you said, providers now folks like you would use different things depending on, and I'm curious, different things depending on, you know, what. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, technology has definitely, you know, enabled a, a lot of people to be able to use these tools. Yeah. Like I said, it was, we operated on a consignment level with all these, these, these small businesses, you know, yep. record shops, laundromats, uh, bodegas, you yeah. know, we were literally drop off 20 tickets, 100 tickets, this were here. And it was on consignment. Hey, you know, you make a, bu a buck out of each ticket. And yep. you have, then the day before the party, we had to go go around and go pick up the tickets. And, yeah. and we had to go do all that stuff. And then, it's crazy. you know, and then little by little, the websites had a popping up. Um, you know, ticket web and all these, all these ticket websites. Well, yeah. express different things, right? Yeah. And then, right. Then, you know, they made it a little bit easier because also you would alongside with that, you also get data, right? Because remember, right. I'm, I'm big on data. So you just bought from me 10 tickets and yep. now I have 10 emails of those 10 people that you were going to, you know, because I would right. do it on, on our website. I think programmatically we would say, okay, you're going to, you bought these tickets you're coming with five people. Please enter the name of all these five people or the email. Right. Blah, blah, blah. And that will go into a bucket, and then we will pick that up and say, "All right, right." So we built so much data; it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fun times, though. <laughs> That's right. And then I guess with um, with sponsors. So obviously, again, I can even think my my father who who tried promoting over when he was younger. It was such a, a sometimes a uh, make or break element in order particularly in the days where you would bring a band and it was expensive or, oh, yeah. or famous dj and i guess your tips on you know relationships what they look for how to find them if you don't know like just curious generally your as your far as like, as far as any like talent relationships or any artists or anything like that um it, it, it's really you know your intention right i think i think a lot of these folks even if you don't know them because i i, I meet people all the time, booking agents and people like that. I don't really know. Um, but I yeah. think it's always your, your reputation follows you. I think that, yeah. I think that if you call a booking agent, that booking agent will make phone calls and say, if they're, if they know how to do their homework, right. They will call and say, Hey, do you know, this guy, Have you, done business? you know, I think a lot of, the, a lot of it is, is, is a buddy system is a referral system and it kind of goes underground where people call each other and say, Hey, do you know this guy? Have you dealt with this person? Or, um, right. and I think if you operate in in a way that your your integrity and your 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 all all the thing your honesty kind of are transparent, I think that reputation follows you, and mm -hmm. people talk. You know, and they'll say, "Yo, I've dealt with Fikia before. Yeah, I did a, You know, right. and they'll say, you know, they may they may have some negative things to say, maybe about my work style, work ethic, but they'll never say. Oh, he didn't pay me, or or you know, I went to the party and there was nobody there, or there's certain things that they may they cannot say, right? Right. Um, they may right. not like how I executed my project, but you know, that's a different conversation. But I think I think relationship wise, I think it, it's key, especially you know, around booking agents, publicists, um, people that are tied to a particular artist that you're interested in. And at the end of the day, it's a business, man. You know, if if yeah. If I was to call Jennifer Lopez right now and say, hey, I got $2 million for you right now to go perform in my backyard, she might consider it, <laughs> you know? Right. And, you know, so I, I think at the end of the day, it's a business. If you approach anyone and you say, hey, I have an interest of booking this talent into this venue, 
And they'll say, okay, well, make an offer, blah, 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 that, that. you know, you go through the whole process. And once right. they understand that you're for real, um, then, you know, I think that relationship is, is born there and you make that relationship. And then you keep right. it, you know, maintain it. No, that's right. That's yeah. right. But, yeah. it's like, you know, it's just to, to sum up the, the, the tips, integrity is a big thing. I think, you know, yeah. do what you say you're going to do. Um, make sure that you don't screw anybody over in the process and make sure you're transparent with all of your dealings and all of the people that you come across. If you right. can't do something, just say, hey, man, I can't do that. Or, you know, but don't promise. You know, I see a lot of these these, these, these promoters, and, you know, and these club owners, you know, out of desperation, they'll go hire someone on the street, not do their due diligence, right? Not say, let me go ask a little more research on this particular person. It's like right. a murder man, you know, let me go, let me go call yeah. places, right? References. And, you know, I, I see a lot of these people doing things that are just not clean, not out of not good integrity, don't pay DJs, don't pay people, right? Do things, you know, and that kind of they don't realize it, but that's destroying their reputation. But right, you know, but you know, you can only you can only do so much and advise people so much. But yeah, that's just have integrity, man. That's just to kind of sum that up. <laughs> no, it makes it makes sense. I had a question that we got via social media earlier. So at Pablo Enrique ESQ on Twitter, he was curious your thoughts, and I have some as well on NFT tickets. So that's obviously we're talking about not fungible yeah. ticket. These are digital contracts that, um, you know, in the Bitcoin or, you know, crypto space where that's sort of a hot uh, buzzword to say, hey, you know, maybe live events moves to using NFT tickets. I'm curious here. Yeah, your, I, uh, I was down with the NFT stuff. Um, and thank you for the question, by the way. Um, yeah. I was dabbling with NFT stuff around more of like a membership kind of thing, right? If you had a particular NFT. So it's funny you say that because I went to Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico is such a crypto NFT yeah. hub. Right, right, right. I go to Puerto Rico to an NFT event and I'm always, my, my brain is always like in, in, in a discovery mode, right? My brain is always yeah. like, oh, let me check that out. So I started networking there. I went by myself to this event and I started networking with people. And I see what they're doing out there. They're doing amazing things around NFTs and and uh, digital contracts, and you know, and, and it's almost like a little cult following that these people are building because you put an NFT out and say this is going to drop tomorrow, and we're going to have a get together and an X bar and blah blah blah, and bring your NFT, and you're going to get. So there's definitely there's definitely opportunity there. I can't speak on it too much because I don't have that much experience on it. Um, yeah. But I I have seen uh event promoters and even record labels even artists themselves right do their own nfts and if hey if you join my club and whatever you're gonna get this drop first and so right. I, i've seen that so there's definitely opportunity there and there's definitely a niche there um although i i have seen uh, the, the nft buzz it's kind of died down yeah. a little bit though i mean the whole NFT bit. thing yeah. Well, that there was a crypto crash, I think, from a value standpoint, that impacted it. And my view of that, you know, I'm, I'm, it was cool to get your feedback on it. Um, and for someone who was involved um, on the sports side, so uh, and things and enter concert venues, sort of side of things, um, I can see the NFT playing the same way as like a commemorative ticket. So back in the day, you go to Super Bowl, you would get this fancy yeah. laminated ticket. So it can certainly serve as that as a, hey, I bought this digital formatted ticket. It gets me into the venue, but then it's a keepsake. It's something that could have uh, resale value in the future, potentially. Absolutely. But, yeah. yeah, but the, but I think that there's also sort of um, uh, ownership by the promoter or by the team that NFT wouldn't fit uh, because they would not want to give up certain contractual rights that I think the ideal NFT enthusiast would be like, yeah, I'd love to have rights of xyz is like no nah, we're not giving you that like we, this just assigns you a seat to a game and you know so there's some of that back and forth and then as you know just practicality of it right now at least yeah where, you know how many unless you're hardcore into the space how do you you know just someone you know a novice who doesn't know what that is how they get engaged with it and you, yeah so and, and i think thing. i think for the masses right for the masses that, that attend right. these events um, it's a small percentage, right? I yeah, think, yeah, correct. I, yeah. I think at least for now, right? Who knows in right. a few years, you know, but at least for now, the very small percentage of folks um, that can have access. But, so I think it's definitely a niche because if you really home in on the NFT stuff and then say, you know what, uh, meet and greet if you have the, this type of NFT or whatever, you know, I'm doing a show, you're going to get to meet, uh, you know, that Yankee because 
you're right. an NFT holder of this. So if you want to bought it on one of these exchanges, OpenSea, whatever it is, if you want to bought right. it, you now have my NFT. You are going to be part of the uh, of this elite group, right? Because right. that's how they were doing it with that uh, with that board eight club, right? You, you know, all these guys. There was like special events that they were going to. I'm like, man, I want to get. I was like, I want to get one of these. Groups. I want to get that. Yeah, yeah. I want right. to go to the next to Dave Chappelle and then Kevin Hart go chill with them. You know. Yeah, but right. They had these secret drops on like, oh, we're gonna do a, a secret party, on, and these celebrities were showing. I mean, it was like a thing. Like I said, now it seems to be the buzz seems to be a little bit died down, but right. I, you know, I'm sure now with the rise of crypto again, I'm sure it's, it's all gonna <laughs> all gonna come back. Right, right, right. It's a back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious that before you go, and this has been great. No, I'm, since I'm good, you, man. no, no, but since you were so, um, I mean, yeah, you, you know, you've done it for a while. There's got to be some great stories just about these legendary artists that people now in a in an arena or a stadium are paying two hundred fifty, three hundred fifty dollars a ticket, and you may have remembered them when they were playing Northwood or Newark or yeah. you know South Bronx wow. back in the aughts, like uh, Daddy Yankee or Alex Sensation or. Uh, the men in ghettos or the uh, aventures you've talked about that, but I'm, I'm just curious an example of a, of a fun story I think people could connect with with all the, uh, uh, the early days. All right, of the stars. I, I, I'll give you <laughs> one, I'll give you one that I always find funny and I always think people find it funny too. Yeah, um, you know, I did a lot of work with Aventura and Romeo in the early on in their career. You know, they were really unknown artists. Um, when I met them and I just latched onto them and started really producing events with them, and I just became friends with them. You know, I mean, Romeo just saw me in Miami the other day. At his album release party for the Formula Volume Three, and he was just hugging me like, "Hey, man, thank you for you know." So he was very grateful and appreciative. You know, I did a lot of work with them in the beginning. Yeah, and there's a record called "Noche de Sexo" by Wisin Yandel and Aventura, yep. right? right? And I was doing the Diva Lounge party that Thursday in Montclair, New Jersey. In Montclair, they used to record in a studio yes, called sir. Skylight Studios in Belleville, New Jersey. Okay. So Johnny Marines, um, who I'm friends with to this day, um, calls me and says, Hey, uh, you, you still doing that party over there? Because we're recording at Skylight. And if we're done early, we're going to come by. I'm like, Oh, yeah, I'm here. Right. So they never showed up, you know. And then the party, you know, when the party ended, I called Johnny back. I said, Hey, you never showed up. What happened? He goes, No, we're still here in the studio. Come by. So I go by the studio. So right. when I get to the studio, which is five minutes away, um, right down the block, yeah, yeah. When I get to the studio, there's we seen Yandel, uh, DJ Casper, the uh, uh, Romel's engineer Jer Jerry, uh, rest in peace, Jerry. He passed away, um, uh, and a few other people there, and that was it. And Johnny Marines, right, right. So we're there, you know. We're just I'm just there hanging out. I'm not I'm not producing anything. I'm just there hanging out, right, right, right. And you know we're just there talking whatever whatever, and on the record and you can go verify this on the record, we sing says uh, gives a shout out to Casper DJ Casper was uh, you know he was affiliated with Don Omar you know he did, so we right. goes and says Casper, so I look at Romeo and I said, well he shout out his DJ you're not gonna shout me out like <laughs> I have a bro right. I am I top liver yeah so yeah anyway yeah. I put that and he's like oh. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you know, it was like peer pressure. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was peer pressure, man. I got on that record because of peer pressure. I'll Look stay right that. now. That's I'm crazy. like, bro, come on, what are you gonna do, bro? You, 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 he, he's, his man is on the, on the record. Are you, how, how you? So he goes, all right, all right, all right. He goes back in the booth, and then you know, and Johnny was there too. He was like, kind of instigating too. Like, yeah, that's true, man. We should be on his record, right? Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so he, if, if you hear the record now, it'll make all of it will make sense to you. But he yeah, goes, yeah. Oh, Johnny, they call him the hit maker, hit maker. Right, and then he continues, and he, you know, I'm standing there, and I'm like, <laughs> he goes, freak out, tell him about the name. So that's how I got on that record because of peer pressure, and I'm like, and Beautiful. it was hilarious because he's like, nah, I got you, I got you. But again, I also think it was his way of, of giving back, and, and that didn't cost him anything. He just felt like this yeah. guy has been, you know, on, you know, on our on our camp for so long and supporting him. Right. So long. I think it was it was just a way of him, of him giving a thank you. Right. Um, with some know, peer pressure, was, needless to say, it was kind of a joke. You know, he did it, <laughs> and it was hilarious. You know, and it was funny because then years later, I go to Premios Lo Nuestro, and I run into Yandel, and and he goes, "Yo, the record came out. Your name was still in it." You know, he's like, "That's it. That's we, right." We, we were laughing about it. I'm like, "Yeah, I thought I was going to get edited out in post production or something like." 
you know, I just happened to be there. Now when he leaves, we'll take it out. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. That's but no, great. Romel's a stand-up guy, man. I, I will tell you, even a few years ago, he did like an Instagram poll. He tagged me on that. He's a guy he never forgets who who has helped him along the way. Um, that's great. He's a person of high integrity in my book. I think that um, he he his entire team and his entire band is still with him to this day. Um, most of the musicians that are with Romeo's band are the ones with the originally with Aventura. Yeah. So that speaks to his his integrity and his word and, and things. So, you know, that was a good example about that. I mean, I have so many more, man, but like um yeah. Don Don Omar, I got another I got a couple of good ones with him. And you know, he <laughs> um, you know, he's he's another one too that, you know, always, you know, always acknowledges, you know, he sees me. Um but, you know, I, I got a funny story with him, too. He actually came to Viva Lounge one day, and, uh, and all his goons were around him, all his bouncers. They're like, you can't come in. But Don just gets up, kind of breaks that whole pack, and he's good. Like, you know, like, and, yeah. you know, and people are like, who the hell is this guy? You know what I mean? But, again, it's those relationships that early on you run into these people, right. and you just say hello, man. You, don't, you know, just don't, don't, you know, don't be a jerk, and, and just say hello and, and give them their due, even, even when – they're not so famous or whatever, but just keep in mind that one day they can be or they will be, you know. Right. So make sure that you treat, you know, like they say, right, you treat Jan like you would the CEO, right? No, that's right. That's yeah. Right. So I, I tend to, 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 you know, a lot of upcoming artists, even though I'm, I may not like your music, I'll take your record. Yeah, I'll check it out. You know, hey, I like it or I wasn't really feeling it. I'll give you feedback. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think people appreciate that. I think people, you yeah. know. Um, if, if you're respectful, if you say say things from a constructive point of view, rather than be like, "Oh, you shit sucks," you know, yeah. um, I think if you do come up, approach that way, I think that also people respect that, and people who are around them. Because the time I went to the studio with Romeo that time with the whole record thing, I didn't yeah. know him. Then. I didn't know him, right? Right. But guess what? When I went to Primero Nuestro, him and I already had a relationship. That's right. He already right. said, hey, what's up? From that meeting, yeah. <laughs> he came up to me and he said, hello. And I'm like, all right. You know, yeah. so, it, you know, those types of relationships and connections, you know, you make them and just try to just, just try to be transparent, try to be yourself and be honest because yeah. if, if you go the fake route and try to just to fit in, people could pick that up right away. And, you know, they know you're just pretending, you know, to be to be liked or whatever. But right. people can detect that shit two seconds. <laughs> All right, no, no, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Well, one quick question before you go. The uh, I'm curious that since you now split between Florida, based in Florida, the split between up here in Florida, is there a difference you feel in the nightlife space? Uh, the vibe you, you say go to a party in Miami or South Florida compared to New York, New Jersey, other than the obvious stuff like weather and whatever, you think there yeah, is? Yeah, I mean, I think the Miami scene, which you know, I really haven't really like. In, indulge myself a lot of it. I mean, I, I, yeah. do an event, I do an event every now and then here at a local spot here in Miami. But um, as far as like Miami is a very, it's a melting pot of so many nationalities, right? You have Dominicans, you got Venezuelans, yeah. you got Colombians, Brazilians, you got a lot of people in, in the state of Florida and in South Florida, particularly um, where I am. Right. And I, I think that because of that widespread net, of, of so many people, you could probably be a lot successful. I think the challenge comes in in networking and try to get into a room and try to get in somewhere where you can put together a really good event or cool event. Um, and I, I think the between comparing to New York and comparing to the Miami market, I would say, you know, in New York and New Jersey, there's a lot more places, right? Okay. But I think here is a lot more people in the terms mm. in terms of not more populated than the, the tri state. Of course not. I never say that, but right. I think a lot more people that go out, right? Because you have Miami is a destination city, right? Miami people come from all over. They come from the West Coast, East Coast, Canada, whatever. So right. I think the the amount of people that are here at one point in time on a weekend is a lot greater than than some than the people that are in New Jersey. Right? Gotcha. right. You have to work really, really hard to put in eight, seven hundred people, eight, you know, in a room in New Jersey. Where right. in, in South Florida, it's not that hard. It's, right. It, yeah. You can do that. Yeah. The you numbers, have an artist yeah. Or, or a particular gimmick or a show that you want to put together and you find a really nice venue that looks really nice and the court really updated modern. And I think you'll be really successful because this this 
if you don't get the locals, you'll get the tourists. So you have kind of right. You, you have two shots at it. <laughs> absolutely. You have two chances of doing this. Um, you know, I mean, and, and the advertising here, I mean, the state of Florida, you know, I mean, you got the planes. You I mean, you got all kinds of things that you could advertise in. Like, you know, we did an event the other day at this place called Danny Casino. Okay. Uh, on Danny Beach. And we had we had planes on the beach. We had right. you know, we had street teams, we had the digital LED trucks. But you know, you reaching those people, you have to go into a lot of these towns where in New York, New Jersey, you probably just put a fly a guy outside of a club <laughs> handing out flyers or, or, or LED trucks or whatever. Right. Um, so it's, I, you know, it's a difference in both. I just think that here you have you have a, a lot more people because of this. A lot more travelers that come here. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So at least at least in South Florida, I know that Tampa, Orlando. I mean, pretty much a whole state. You know. Uh, and then right. you know, there's a lot of places here that you know that that don't have these event promoters and producers that are really putting together these epic things. And then the the really big one, like State Space, uh, Eleven, all the big big clubs, um, they do their own thing. They have their own in-house marketing. They have their own, you know, and people come. I think as long as the the venue looks really good and the music is good, the lighting is good. The drinks are good, right? I think people eventually will just say, you know what, this is gonna be my spot. I'm gonna go right. There. Yeah. Right. No, indeed. So yeah, I'd love for you, uh, DJ Fidical, plug anything you got coming up soon. Tell us where folks can find you, social media, all of that. Yeah, you can find me on at Fidical, without the DJ, the way you see it there. So just at Fidical, pretty much anywhere on social media. Um, I just wrapped up a party with Diana Lapechao in Newark. I saw that, yeah. Jersey. Yeah, we just it's we a just good band, man. Diana's good. And he happened to win an award last night in the yard, the Soberano, which is which is like the Grammys here in, in, uh, in the United States. And right. The Soberano in the yard is pretty big. Um, so we just wrapped that up and we're trying to see, we're, we're trying now to work on another act. Um, and then I have another project called uh, Bachateria, um, which is basically a a Four, four to five artists uh, showcase that we do with new artists, upcoming artists. We did New York SOBs. Uh, we did La Boom in Queens. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to do stuff with a lot of up and coming artists. I want to start to develop more artists and, and push more artists um, that are new because I, you know, I, I do believe the next Romeo, the next Petty Yankee, you know, the next Alpha is out there. Right. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I've been doing that in the past past six months. Um, I, also, I did a billboard party in Miami around the billboard awards. So things like that, I mean, I'm kind of focusing on that. You know, it, it allowed me to really get creative and take my time, right? Where I'm not doing it every week, right? So right. Um, there's another project we're working on, Dominicana Music Week, um, with my, my friend Pills and, and, and DR. So there's a lot of things brewing up here and there that I have my hands in. But again, you know, um, at this point in my career, I want to pick and choose some things that, that I want to do. Yeah. Right, the weekly thing for me, I don't know, if it, you know, unless it's something really crazy. Um, the weekly thing is probably something behind me now. Where now sure. we focus on special events, um, industry events, or artist showcases, kind of thing. That's great. Um, I've already had a couple of record labels reach out and say, "Hey, we want you to put together a showcase for us." And so you know, it's things like that that I, I, I you know, I, I have to enjoy. You know, and that's another, another tip there. You have to enjoy it. That's it. You have to like what you do. You have to like this. There'll be days where you work your ass off. You see no money. You see nothing. See no people. Nothing. But right. You gotta just dust yourself off. Go and, and try it again. And that consistency, I think, is eventually what people will, would identify you and say, "Man, I like this guy because this guy doesn't give up. This guy continues. He failed, but he kept going." You know. So I, a lot of the things that, and believe me, even even with all the experience that I've had, I still fail. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so that's it's, right. It's not, I'm not immune to that. You know what I mean? I still fail. I still do an event. No one goes or no traction. And, you know, it happens. You know, it's just part of the part of the game. All right. Indeed. Well, DJ Fricao, thanks so much for joining us, brother. This was great. No, thank you. I, I, I enjoy this conversation a lot. You you actually reminded me of things that I had done that I had forgotten about. <laughs> Look at that. That's my fault. Good stuff. All right. <laughs> well, definitely See. appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for, for having me on. And, you know, and, uh, Shout out to everybody who's uh, who's tuned in to Open Seat Direct and go check them out. That's it. Thank you, brother. Thank